Hello, hello, and welcome to Rory's Brainworks, where we get creative and see if it works. Today, we will be reading chapter three from my book. You guys have sent me a whole bunch of great comments and critiques. It just fills my heart with light and joy. So without further ado, let's just keep this good thing going and continue the storytelling with The Warsinger Opus, A Breaking of Bells, by Rory Thomason. Chapter 3. Smiles from a Rose Predictably, the two days following Shun's resurrection was awkward, to say the least. The sailors that had always given him a wide berth were taking every precaution to keep to the other side of the ship. The three-day voyage back to Belrose had a constant whisper of the tale circulating from ear to ear, the rise from the grave of Sholan, as they called it. They ignored the once-drowned man, preferring him to keep to himself rather than performing his duties on the ship. As far as the crew was concerned, he was still a corpse. A dead man refusing to leave the ship, uncomfortably taking refuge in his hammock below deck. The men who slept near Tishan had all suddenly decided to take up pillow and blanket above deck to sleep beneath the stars. Peleans were notoriously superstitious, and the sailors among them even more so. Shun had seen it all before. Staring absent-mindedly at the planks of wood above him, Shun looked for vague pictures hidden in the twisting grains of old tree growth as the days passed. It was an overly tedious and upsetting way to spend his time. The pursuit of distraction was made difficult as Shun's mind spun every line of grain to exemplify the sharp, prominent features of the pale woman. Curves matching her cheek and chin, a cut that looked like the gentle round of her nose, knots in the wood like sympathetic eyes that understood him. At this point, nothing could really stop his mind from bulging with questions. It racked with a persistent ache, making the nights sleepless and the days long. Shun wished for answers with time, but there was none outside of his own cutting pessimisms. The only reasonable answer that could be mustered was Shun's essence was worth so little that even death refused to take it. Shun wallowed with that thought for days. Killing himself wasn't an option either, which was the real perpetual tragedy. Shun had tried. He had tried so many times once that the pale woman stopped coming to see him. Doing so gained nothing. Shun was well and truly trapped in this prison, with no barring and no guards. A jail formed in cruelty by a hand sadistic as it was genius. Docking early, amidst a morning haze, Shun walked the gangplank of the Princess Blade alone, ahead of every sailor that was still too terrified to be near him. The forlorn man had no possessions to speak of when he boarded the ship, but he did leave with his slumped shoulders and a back weak with a burden no one could see him carrying, a lofty weight. Belrose had a wharf bustling with energy and shifting bodies. Shun's home was three miles south of the Belrose walls, a cave fit for any hermit. He tried to make quick work of the pier and the fish market, but the folk were busy with trade. Loud voices barked prices, and merchants shouldered one another to purchase the best catches. It was a wall stopping Shun from finding the comfort of home. The last comfort he could rely on. The only comfort he had known of late. Shun wanted to be far from the Princess Blade, far from the rushing river of gossip that would spread like plague waters. Sailors talked too much, too quickly, and Shun was far too recognizable to deny the descriptions, the bald, red-eyed man that could defy death. What stories would they weave? Shun could almost hear them, tavern room tales of his essence torn asunder so that death did not recognize him as alive and as such could not take him, or how Shallan wanted him for greater things so she spat him out of the sea and back onto the deck of the princess blade. By this time tomorrow's sun broke the horizon, there would already be five different renditions of his harrowing ascent from the depths of the Crimson Sea, brokering deals with deep, gold-cast gods to be a puppet in their hands, forced into some righteous plot to overthrow the Belrose family. 
damned with a quest to sink a dagger into King Gillian's chest and sit the throne himself as some thrall to their holy agenda or whatever unlikely fabrication they could conjure. Exaggeration is married to sailors as lies were to politics. There's a reason you don't hear stories of smithies finding a half-woman, half-iron seductress lit by the midnight fires of their forge. <laughs> There's a reason farmers don't tell of losing half a plantation's workforce to a cabbage kraken. It was not in their nature. They were honest professions held by honest people. If you wanted to keep a secret, avoid the docks. Shun had free reign of the inner streets away from the busy western wharf. Bare roads made for quicker travel, and Shun had a mind to put the city far behind him. Massive, forty-foot white walls surrounded the cities, knuckled with parapets and narrow walkways. Shun had just entered from the west and was walking toward the second circle of walls deeper into the city that separated the districts. At least... The walls separated the painted lords from the rest of the common folk. The bulk of the city was called the Glade, but everyone just referred to it as the Dirt. Shun would walk the dirt ways until he reached the high walls of the painted lords, the Stems. Shun would then follow that circle until he was at the southern church of the faithful and take the streets south, out the city. It would be easy as long as the city guards didn't give him a hard time as he followed the walls near to the Stems. Those guards were thorn keepers. Protectors of the pricks, painted lords often were. Schemers, politicians, and the well-to-do rubbing elbows with their own ilk. Playing games of chance with the lives of their supplicants. City life was not meant for shun. If it wasn't the people, it was surely the politics and royals eager to lick the backsides of other royals. Anger was not something shun felt. But it did boil his blood when he thought of powerful men suppressing the less fortunate. Shun looked at Belrose Castle as he traveled nearer to the stems. It was a grand palace and the sitting throne of power. Shun disliked it, but it was a beautiful structure. An architectural feat crafted by people who believed in something greater than themselves. Her main tower held a plethora of smaller towers connected by large arcing walkways that looked like a flower in bloom, petals facing the sun in a smile. The Church of the Faithful was a spiked and discolored weed in comparison. Sharp angles, flanged shapes, wrought in iron and sandstone, the building was beautiful in a foreboding and deadly kind of way, demanding deference through fear, which is how most of the populace viewed the church and the mylands within. They were powerful people that wielded laws above those of men, ears to the gods and heralds of their mandates. Mylands were intimidating even when engaged in gentle conversation. Their churches were just the same, frightful homes of goodwill and salvation. The smoky morning air was bitten by a chill. Spring was still dearly holding on to the last caress of winter. Tendrils of the winter's heart stubbornly wafted frost to the tips of the grass, crunching below Shun as he passed under the arch of the southern gate, leaving Belrose. The Rose Road splintered to the northeast and to the south. The northerly route would lead to Southland Garen and Marin's Belt. Shun would likely travel on that very road, but for the time being he meandered on the southern side toward Bryn and the Titanic Peaks. A few thin-traveled trails ran off the road and into hunting grounds. Shun turned into those small southern trails cut into the tall grass. His home didn't have much, but he did store some food and spare coin, which would last until he could find work in either of those two close towns to the north. The foothills nearby were sharp, stone-cut rifts of earth, replete with wildlife and vegetation that provided for Sean when he didn't have the energy to go into Belrose. The seclusion was something he wanted. The loneliness was a penance, a price he needed to pay, an atonement he set on himself, but the problem was that Sean couldn't remember why. He felt strongly in his essence that he needed to, and to him, that was enough. After the deer trails guttered off and were taken over by the plant life again, Shun went on landmarks and memory to find his cave. It was easy to spot, all things considered. It didn't take a seasoned hunter to discover. 
It was out of the way enough that people didn't come snooping around all that often. Visitors were another burden he need not shoulder. When Shun reached the familiar grounds of his little dwelling, he made a caution patrol of the surrounding area, and only after he convinced himself that it remained undisturbed did he finally push back the hide door and enter. Shun sat on the leather and linen flooring he had placed and began to reach over and organize the small items that he thought he would take with him. Scant belongings were a mantra. The foreign man carried and kept secure what was necessary to live on for a few days, enough to pick up and leave immediately should the threat arise. Now was the time to do just that. There were small reserves of salted meat and cheeses wrapped in linen that Shun had dug into nearby storage pits. Shun stuffed them into a small pack and rolled up his thin bedroll with it. The pack itself brought up a quick memory of why Shun had come to Belrose in the first place. He had learned to make packs like this working with a few folk in Bryn to the south. Nice people. Gentle people. A group of tailors and leather workers that cared for one another. They were warm and inviting, acting friendly towards Shun when he had first stumbled upon them. It was a sad day when he had to leave, although Shun had slipped on a roof tile and plummeted twenty feet onto his neck. They all fled when he stood and used a tree branch to beat two bones back into his neck. Thankfully, the story never made its way to Belrose. It was likely too unbelievable to travel that far. Shun twisted the pack onto his shoulder and got up to leave, but then he remembered a song. A song lost to time. A song he had heard, but had never himself sung. Shun slowly turned back around and looked to a, a barren corner of his small cave that the light didn't touch. It was a place he did not tread, but stared at often. The music came from there. The notes held loss in the strong melody, but there were also notes of victory. There was courage and worth and optimism in that song, and Shun feared those most of all. They were things he could never be. They were also things he couldn't leave behind. There was hurt in his bones that wouldn't let him leave without digging up that sonata, so Shun watched that spot and dropped to his knees. Plunging his hands into the cold packed dirt, Shun started to dig at the ground with reluctant fervor. He knew what he had buried was deep. It was a grave after all, a ghost in rest. Shun's fingers burned with the effort of the digging, tearing at his nails, ripping the keratin. The forefinger that had lost its nail had regrown in under a day, but it still pulsed with a dull ache with every grasping handful of dirt exhumed. When one of the working digits caught the batting of a burlap linen, Shun took a large breath and snatched at the corner, pulling it out of the ground. Holding in his hands, Shun inspected the solid memory. A small, tightly wound pack of artifacts he hadn't opened since he had tied them up. It felt overly heavy in his grip. Shun stuffed it in his pack and walked out to the cave, never looking back on the home he had created here. It wasn't a true home, just a place to stay. Shun had no hearth to call his own. Returning back to the Rose Road, Shun bought a loaf of warm bread and two apples from a few merchants that had a full cart making their way into Belrose. They looked at Shun as though the stories from the sailors had already reached them, but that couldn't be. They were coming from the north. They just didn't have any trust for him. They looked into his eyes and had nothing but cold shoulders and curt words. Shun expected nothing less. It was his right to suffer the abuse. It didn't matter. He would never see them again. Shun started to eat one of the apples and half the bread. He stored the rest as he began the long trek northward. There was no true destination. Shun had a direction and an aim, getting far from the bay and the sea, away from the stories and away from the spotlight. There were only a handful of places Shun knew outside of Belrose, Bryn, where he couldn't go back, and Marin's belt to the north that the sailors on the Princess Blade always used to speak well about. Shun stumbled a bit on his weak legs. It was a bit foolish to start walking as soon as he left the ship. It would have been more prudent to rest a while. He didn't sleep or eat for two days, and the last he checked, his body still needed to do those. It was a real wonder he could stand at all. Shun took a deep breath. 
4 second inhales, 4 second exhales, 8 is the divine number. Shun looked up slightly confused. Why did he just speak aloud? Shun was alone. Not only that, but he didn't know what he was saying either. What does 8 is the divine number even mean? The road was shared with a few farmers and folk on journey. Shared being relative, they were all going into town in the early morning light and Shun was leaving. Walking against the normal flow of traffic seemed an apt metaphor to the foreign man. People don't last long enough to be friends if you're constantly walking away from them. Shun stared at the hard-packed dirt road and focused on clearing his thoughts. It was going to be a long walk, and the sooner he could empty his mind and embrace a state of nothingness, the better. Shun cleared a space and found a peaceful, arid black land in his mind, a dark void that he could call his own, a calm respite in his head. But every time Shun finally settled in, got comfortable or seemed content, a gray orb started to form in the back of that infinite black. Shun would shake the thought forming in his mind, recenter himself, and enter that safe space again, but the gray orb returned. Death was a constant force of fantasy for Shun. She could provide oblivion, and he wanted her for it. Well, what do we have here? A jagged and harsh voice spoke from the sparse tree coverage to the side of the road. A lone traveler? Startled, Shun broke away from his stare to the road and looked up. Three men were walking out of the high grass between trunks of oaks to meet him on the road. Shun looked around himself and noticed he was alone, as the man said. How long had he been walking? Sometimes when Shun got into his own head, he lost track of time, spatially aware as a distracted child. A handle of hours? A, a blade of hours? Enough time that a guard or rider could not hear him if he yelled for help. The men had low-born bearings. One was Pelayan and the other two were from nearby. Brigands, highwaymen, thieves, whatever they called themselves, they were low lives. Vultures, picking at dead men. Two are armed with cudgels, very imprecise and cumbersome, Shun thought to himself, assessing the men in front of him. That one has a knife. He leads them. Look at the way he stands. He stands like he was tall. The other two stoop their backs to seem lesser. He is the one that spoke. His left foot has a pronounced pronation, likely from an old knee injury. His forearms are strong, but he uses his wrists to swing the knife by the way he holds it. He has no proper training. A broken nose from past fights. Scar above left head leading into scalp. Broken bottle smashed against the head, perhaps. Stance is too close. He's not steady. A heavy emphasis on his heels. He didn't mean to weigh the men, but there was a, a way body sung that Shun instinctually had a good ear for. One of the other brigands spoke. Look, Bill, he don't even have a weapon. Must be daft to be alone this far out the rows unarmed. That he does not, Bill said while slyly waggling the knife in his hand. All right, boy, hand us your coin and any other valuables and we may not beat you that bad. Shun stood unmoving. He could have given them his pack, but what would it matter if they planned on violence anyway? In the essence of every man was a song that played in concert with who they were. Shun could not hear that. Not the way that the Mylans did, but it didn't take special training to know what kind of music these men made. Each of them were ugly notes. Their discordance was raw and grating. Confident, eh? Bill said. You want us to pummel you and take your things? Then we will, boy. I will be happy either way. The bandit threw the knife into the ground and took off the vest that covered his bare chest. The twang from the handle stopped as he got closer. Without thought, Shun lowered and widened his stance. He raised his right fist close to his chin while his left hand extended outward like an open claw. The lackeys on either side of Bill laughed. Bill stopped in his tracks by the sheer novelty. 
Oh, I think he means to try and cuff you back, Bill, one of them said. The thief held up his fists and jumped up a few times to get his blood pumping, readying himself to mercilessly beat Shun. The foreign man was surprised by the way his body reacted. This level of self-preservation and flamboyance wasn't normal. However, something deep inside Shun banged against his senses and set his mind to protecting himself. Time felt slow as Bill readied himself to attack. Right punch, Jean thought. It is the stronger of his arms, but his weak form diminishes his power. His right hip is not behind the blow. Block with a dragon's tooth, then counterattack with a sweeping tail to his left knee. Three tiger blossom strikes to the chest and up to his throat. Grasp with a fox's maw and bring his body to the red general's kneel. End fight by either waiting for a yield or his arm breaking. Crack! Bill's fist connected with Shun's jaw. The foreign man just stood there and took the hit. The blow had forced him to one knee. The dislocated hinge of his mandible uncomfortably crunched back into place as Shun clenched it shut again. He kept his right hand raised to his chin, though, while the left one held outward. He will kick me with his left foot to my mid, Shun thought again. Dodge with the smoky exhale. Lean into Emperor's Cobra pose and counterattack with burning heel. Thwack! A thin leather boot impacted deep into Shun's gut. Air left lungs like a bellows. A strand of spittle connected Shun's mouth to the dirt as he prostrated, buckled over. Next will come a blow to my occiput. Dodge left and spin into the scorching wind's dance. Once he's fallen over, strike with tiger blossoms to his chest. Don't let him regain breath. Follow gallop kicks to his center. Dragon kiss to the hyoid, collapsing the windpipe. Victory. Shun rolled to his left and swept with his leg. Bill tumbled to the ground as the kick connected with his weak left ankle. Shun took a wide step and thrust both of his palms forward, striking at the bandit's sternum, popping ribs out of place. Bill sharply exhaled and Shun shifted his foot above his head to try and bring down his heel. Snap! Crunch! Shun was struck in the back of the head by a heavy wooden cudgel. Bill's toadies had intervened. The area seared raw with pain. Dots blinked in and out of Shun's vision before his face slammed into the dirt. The sickening sound of nose cartilage separating and breaking echoed in his mind. The world was spinning and Shun's body was ready to upend the apple and the bread he had eaten earlier. The men began to laugh. Humor was being shared like predators surrounding infirm prey. They thought themselves mighty hunters instead of the scavengers they were. Their merriment was not long-lived, though. The sounds of galloping hooves were pattering in the distance. Uh, Bill, one of the men said to their leader, in the unsure and cautioned tone cowards are known for singing. Gods above and below, Bill cursed as he bent down and tried to sh take Shun's pack from off his back. Just what we need! Shun's limp body didn't make the theft easy. Passive weight was a surprising countermeasure. The rider that was coming to Shun's rescue wasn't necessary. He had this all in hand. Really, what is the worst these men could do to him? Go! Bill screamed as he and his fellows ran back into the high grass on the side of the road. They sprinted, tails between their legs, following some trail back to whatever cesspool they called a home. Shun managed to look from the ground. Saliva ran from the dust and rocks to his lips. The rider had dismounted his horse and went to a low fighting stance near to Shun's pathetically splayed body. He was handsome and well-groomed, light chestnut hair streaked with blonde which was matted in places by sweat. His small muscles were hugged by a tight black-sleeved doublet. The cuffs had been rolled up to his forearms. He wore a hard leather jerkin that bobbed up and down in heaves as the man yelled at the escaping brigands. The sounds of leather stretching with the effort was magnified by the two belts he had strung around his hip. Each belt carried a long sword. The lower of the two swords, still sheathed, was slightly longer and had a vibrant and beautifully adorned scabbard. 
a connected stretch of symbols Shun didn't know were etched in gold that ran from hilt to point. The rider's left hand was on the pommel of that sword, white knuckles gripping firmly, while the other hand brandished the normal longsword just above it. Shun lowered his head again and watched the man pace back and forth while shouting insults. Loose black trousers billowed with his ambulations. Tight brown boots meant for a battlefield crunched softly on the earth. This man was no ordinary traveler. He was dressed for action but didn't look like a guard. And, and your mother was a dog's chewing stick, the Lordling shouted. And if you did have any siblings, then I imagine they are twice the coward and three times the ingrate you are, you... You, uh... The man thought awkwardly between short breaths from his puffed-out chest. You unwanted vagrants! Sad excuses for pig's feed, you are! The handsome Lordling kicked dirt in the fleeing men's direction as he turned toward Shun and sheathed the sword. Cowards, the man said as he made a disbelieving gesture. Gods be damned. Can't even muster the decency to face their fate like men. <laughs> Can you believe this? No wonder us common folk, you and I, think there's no real justice outside the city walls. The man looked down at Shun, who was barely conscious on the dirt. Oh, right! I nearly forgot you were being beaten half to death. The quick feet of the lordling shuffled close to Shun, and he could feel the man leaning over his body. With careful hands, he turned Shun over and began dabbing at some of the bulbous impact areas with a white cloth pulled from his back trouser pocket. He gave due diligence to inspection of the wounds. A sly smirk took form in front of the concern he had been wearing. Ah, no worries, friend. He said softly and sure of mine. Just a few scrapes and a broken nose? Come on, rest up with me in the shade of the trees. I have some water and spare cloth you can clean yourself up with. <laughs> you look like you just tried to swim up the road. Not the best look for anyone. The lordling grabbed Shun from below the arms and dragged him over to the trees, propping up his back on the cool side of an oak. The rider whistled to his horse, and the black gelding took light, jaunty steps toward them. Each bouncing clop highlighted the white, long-haired ends of his legs. This is no time to show off, the rider said. Just come here and stop trying to impress our new friend. The lordling looked to Shun, who was having a hard time keeping his head up. You see, Vider here pays too much attention to first impressions. He did the same thing when he met me, and I've spoiled him rotten since. He thinks if he does this the same to others, they'll give him treats just as much as I do. The man turned to the horse still bouncing slowly to them. But that's not how this works, you buffoon! Rummaging through the saddlebags, the rider pulled out a water skin and a square tear of brown linen. Handing them to Shun, the man immediately resumed conversation while Shun slowly began to pour water onto the rag and dab his own face and wash it clean. Wait, why was Shun doing this again? He didn't care if he was clean or not. Didn't care whether he looked healthy or near to death. Why did he just heed this lordling's advice? The name is Benjamin Bell, the handsome lordling had begun before he paused and shifted his eye side to side. Uh, ben. Yeah, Benjamin Ben. I mean, Benjamin or Ben. You can call me either. Actually, let's just stick with Ben. Yeah, just Ben. Very simple. Keeps a rustic appeal with the low folk. You know, folk like us. You and I. Shun watched the young lordling veer from his verbal train of thought and begin staring off into the distance, no doubt walking into a deep glade of his own inner dialogue. Shun didn't like the man, which was an unsurprising revelation. Still wetting the cloth and cleaning his wounds, Shun started to look over Ben, trying to hear just who exactly was the man that had come to his unnecessary rescue. Ben had a short but strong straight nose. Thick pink lips, almost at a pucker, emphasized his handsome, almost pretty face. His chin was solid but followed a thin jaw. The skin was closely shaved, but the beginning of cheek stubble gave way that he could grow a healthy beard, but preferred it smooth. His eyes, though, his eyes were like nothing Shun had ever seen before. They shined a golden amber glow in the sunlight. His pupils were a deep black beside those honeyed irises, 
and a silver light would glint from beneath. Yes, yes. Well, Ben said as he started to shake himself from his musings, What of you, friend? What do they call you? What's your name? Name? Shun asked. Ben responded with a vigorous collection of attentive nods, the way a puppy would entertain a man if it were smart enough. Shun is name, the foreign man said with a limp finger pointed at himself. Shun! Ben exclaimed. Well met! Benjamin clapped a hand firmly onto Shun's shoulder. The injured man winced with the impact. In reaction, Ben immediately pulled his hand away and looked at it as if the action was not his own. <laughs> Wicker and willows! The young lordling cursed. I'm so sorry, friend. Slipped my mind, he chuckled quickly before suddenly examining Shun's head. Wow, look at those eyes of yours. And your face, too. Well, I would say I've not met a man like you in all of my years. Where do you hail from? Shun raised an eyebrow. The barrage of social interaction was a little much after taking a few solid cracks to the head from cudgels. Shun squinted and tried keeping to his usual course of engagement, simply not to say anything. Oddly, Shun did feel compelled to answer the young lordling's question. Benjamin took the brief opportunity offered by the silence to speak some more. No worries, he said. I can wager a few guesses. You look tan enough to be a Palaean, but it doesn't look like a tan as much as it does a natural hue, but you could still be a southerner yet. Maybe not too far south. You haven't said much, but from what I can tell, it doesn't have the Palaean flair, so you're definitely north of the Titan Peak, so... Bryn? Gint? Bartos? Quilbat Keep? Armorinth? Southland Garen? Wait, Southland Garen is north of here. Confuses me sometimes, but you know, has south in the name and all. Ben held up a hand to his face, rubbing his chin in thought. Any of those? Shun slowly and silently shook his head. Ben didn't seem the least bit inconvenienced by the foreign man's lack of dialogue. Ben looked to be substituting the silence with an unheard half of a conversation. We'll just keep Bryn and Bartos as a soft answer for now, Ben said as he looked to the sky. Hold on a moment. Isn't Bartos also to the north? Actually, that might just be the most northern city in Eastern Tell. Ben turned sharply to face his horse. Viter, uh, your foot, please. The black gelding lifted his fore hoof, and as Ben took hold of it and rested the muscular leg on his knee, he inspected the shoe. The young lower league started to trace the metal with his finger and muttering to himself. Ah, geography was always my weakness. Perth always said so. Now, if this shoe is tell, Ben said as he went from the left to right around the shoe, then we're on this side. The finger landed on the inside of the right half of the shoe. Bartos was the last city taken by the unified rose, which would mean that it is in fact... Ben's finger crossed diagonally to the top right of the horseshoe. Up here. Ben let the foot fall back down and patted Viter with his hand before walking back to Sean, with a look of disappointment in his stare. I'm sorry, Sean, he began. I just remember that Bartos is far to the northeast of Tell and... Maybe guessing you were from there might have been insensitive, and for that I humbly beg your forgiveness. Unless, of course, folk from Bartos do look and speak like you. I don't rightly know. I've never been. Ben smiled wide as a consolation, but quickly turned without two moments of inaction to go retrieve the knife Bill had thrown to the ground. Ben yanked it from the earth and inspected all the facets of the weapon. He held the grip and peered down the blade before juggling it up and down a few times. Your knife? Ben asked. Shun shook his head once more. Well, it's yours now. With a toss, Ben had sunk the knife into the bark of another oak across from where Shun was sitting. The blade was buried into its exposed tang. Shun made a disapproving half-frown and shook his head again, denying the gift. You might want to reconsider, friend. Ben said as he walked back to Viter and began stroking at the mount's neck. The mane of the horse was also a milky white. The tips of the ears and even the eyelashes were too. It was a striking beast, bristling with well-toned and bulging muscle beneath a coat dark as a starless night. A rich saddle of dark leather rested comfortably on the gelding's back, gold inlay twisted at the trim and around the back saddlebags. 
War mount straps for lance, sword, and armor hung from the clasps at the side of the saddle. They were loosely hanging without the implements they were meant for. I managed to see some of the fight, Shun, Ben said with a tone that had flatly lost some of its joyous spark. His smile partially abated. You started well with an interesting fighting stance, but you just yielded to the pummeling. But then, then you struck, and it was a wild attack. Without lies, I've never seen someone fight like you before. It was like you were dancing before those thugs hit you over the head. It's certainly not the first altercation you've ever been in either. I can see the scarring on your knuckles, the calluses on your hands, matted, hard skin on your elbows and forearms shun. You're trained. That is clear to see to anyone that is looking right. You've likely beaten men ten times the worth of those cowards. So why didn't you protect yourself? Shun took a drink from the water skin and abstained from answering. There was no need to. Shun didn't need protecting. What he needed was an end to this perpetual suffering of his, and this lordling wasn't going to get him any closer to achieving that goal. Had I not come, those men would have killed you, Ben said as he watched Shun stand and walk toward him. The beaten man held out the water skin and bowed. Ben took it and turned to place it back in his saddlebag, but Shun wasn't there when he turned back around. Shun was already walking down the Rose Road, north to whatever awaited him there. He shifted his arms and tossed the bag on his back until it felt right sitting on his sore shoulders. Shun twisted his right elbow to his left upraised knee in the walk, back cracking in six places. Then he stepped again and did the same with his opposite limbs, back cracking another two times. Eight was the divine number. (laughs) What a silly thought. Shun quickened his pace. He had lost a bit of time with the fight and the laying about. He had a mighty need to be far away from Belrose. His breaths were already slow and almost stilted. Something in his chest felt off with the beating he had just endured. A raspy struggle echoed with the strain of inhaling, but it was just another annoyance that could do little to hurt him now. Shun looked down to his clothing and tried to brush off some of the dirt and spittle that had made a picture on his chest. He was going to have to stop near a river before making it to the next village and wash that off. The clip-clop of horse footfalls started up and approached from behind. Shun let loose a long sigh as they slowed near to him. Ahoy there, traveler, Ben hollered. It seems we walk the same way. Mind if I keep company with you? Ben's grin was light and smug. There was a small, vexing itch, scratching woe into the back of Shun's head at the thought of traveling with this man. He was ready to deny Ben the pleasure, but before he could voice his intentions, his mouth spoke something entirely different. No, Shun said. Shun furrowed his brow and almost tripped over his own foot. No? No? Did he really just say no? Of course Shun minded. Having a traveling companion was the absolute worst scenario, let alone a chirpy and stupidly optimistic man with as much social restraint as a gossip in high court. There was a sway of positive energy radiating off the young lorling, and it battled against the crash of Shun's despair. Ben probably wasn't aware of it either, but Shun could sense his pity, unintentional or not. Unfortunately, there were layers of self-loathing that Ben's witty, happy words just couldn't scrape away. So what do you seek out there, Shun? Ben asked as his hand traced the horizon. What do you want to find? Work. Shun poked a short and to-the-point answer in hopes that it would stop a conversation from forming. (laughs) Ha ha, yes. Understood. I have a job to do as well. Ben's current look challenged the road ahead and almost dared the world to bring him a worthy foe to topple, a worthy cause to herald. Honestly, it made Shun sick. It was a terrible way to see life as though you wanted for tribulations to conquer, prove your worth by surviving to impress peers and folk alike. Shun could see that 
yearning in Ben's golden eyes as they stared down the open rose road. The young lordling's left hand rested gently on the intricate pommel of the lower sword on his hip, swaying as the slow clopping steps of his warhorse kept down the road. This man was dangerous. He had the look that followed madmen, men who laughed at the loom of destruction. What say we get some supper together, Ben entertained. I know we're getting near to Weldonshire, a small little village, quaint even. I'm sure there'll be a fine little inn there. The common room would probably be a little heated with a few ragamuffins and a strong hearth fire. Sometimes the inn has a few shady characters, but the food can't be beat and the wine is sweet as it is sour. <laughs> Maybe a few well-endowed barmaids giving us the eye? Ben leaned over to Shun and raised his eyebrows up and down. A bard, a stingy innkeep, a thief with a heart song like golden sunlight. Shun didn't anticipate any of this, and was sad to think Ben did. The poor, foolish lordling had likely been cooped up in his manor, ear next to an orator as he spun tales of common man and the adventurous life of the open world. And here Ben was, traveling that road, imagining himself some character in a story great as any other. Shun knew what the world really was, though. A constant fight against everyone to continue breathing, so that you could see another morning come and face that day surviving tooth and nail. There was disappointment and despair ahead of Ben. Shun knew it as sure as he could see it. This handsome lordling wore blinders of ignorance, but would soon learn. That was the one constant the world could provide. Do you know what fate is, Shun? Ben asked abruptly. Sure, Shun responded with a few nods while also managing to look disinterested. <laughs> no, it's not something I can show you, Ben responded, ignoring the way Shun was moving to explain something hurriedly. Fate is when something feels right, natural. Like, the gods steer your reins, guiding your way. Ben's hazy gaze was lost in the romanticized words. When something happens for a reason, you may not understand it at the time, but it is meant to be. That is fate, friend. Ben nodded down to Sean, and the look was not returned. I think it was fate that put us together. I can feel it as sure as I do my own bones. No. The friendless man responded curtly. Shun was attempting to detangle himself from the lines of friendship Ben was haphazardly and happily trying to wrap around him. He had to shoot down Ben's dreaming like an arrow through a hawk's soaring flight. It was not his intention to hurt the man's feelings, but if that is what he needed to do in order to separate the distance Ben was trying to close, then he would. Shun didn't need someone to rely on. He didn't need someone that relied on him. He could not afford friends. The infinite pool Ben seemed to draw his drive and motivation from stubbornly bent the man over and shook at his ribs with howls. Ben's optimism laughed at Shun, laughed at the gritty denial like there couldn't be a more ridiculous answer. <laughs> that, is, that is good, Shun. That is rich and wholesome. Ben said with a fading titter. <laughs> Brave words to deny fate. I like the way you think. But a man that denies fate will soon grow accustomed to coincidence. Whether you think it or not, Sean, I feel it so. Cillians have a, a knack for this sort of thing. Ben smiled and remained silent for a time. A long moment of silence that Sean was thankful for. Sean had found himself wringing his hands with anxiety and noticed that the nail he had lost earlier was thicker than the rest. The wound that had been punctured had closed and only took half a day for Sean's ankle to be normal again, too. He healed quickly, too quickly, like death did her best to keep him from her side and gave him a healthy, long life. The trees along the road gathered more fiercely. A forested canopy stretched overhead. The roadway turned into a tunnel, blocking out most of the afternoon sun. The pace had been steady throughout the trip. Ben was patiently smiling in his saddle. The gelding, on the other hand, was full of energy. 
Their war horse would bounce up and down anxiously, but a few hushed words of encouragement from the young lordling seemed to settle him back down again. Ben had shared food with Shun as well, nearly forcing salted meat into his hands that he had stowed away in his saddlebags. Each shared in an apple, and Ben even thumbed Shun a few grapes he had in a small silk bag. No words were exchanged. Shun didn't like taking food, but he would use the generosity to help him survive all the more. If he didn't have to tap into his own food reserves, then he was better off for it. If Ben wanted to go through his twice as fast, then that would be his problem. Shun would no longer be a part of that nonsense as soon as he found the chance to escape. The road had become silent and peaceful. Birds chirped and a clement wind played music through the leaves and pines of trees. Wagon wheel ruts started to form in the hard packed dirt just as a few farmlands spied between trees started to pop up with healthy crops. The proof of man making influence on the land was evident. Two rabbits darted from one side of the road to the other, a little of the wild skirting the dangerous townships of humans. No matter how serene though, Shun felt an uneasy grip on the back of his neck that forced his head to observe the dirt for the better part of the day's journey. It was an anxious need that wanted nothing more than to flee. Weldonshire sprouted out of the distance like a wild thorn bush. In the center of the village lay an inn that handily reached over the other cottages and buildings scattered in all directions. The second story didn't seem like a lot after coming from Belrose, but after the long walk down the Rose Road with nothing but a scattering of tall oaks, it was a giant with that second story. Strong folk walking on the rough dirt roads held on to tools of farming and trade and crates of recently purchased or traded supplies. The air smelt of tilled earth and manure, and on occasion a rogue cow mooed an ambiguous call. Shun could feel the warmth of Ben's smile before he even turned to actually look at the man. Weldonshire was exactly the type of rustic village he had heard about, and no doubt he was beside himself with the adventurous heart he kept. When the two had entered the small village, most folk didn't pay them much mind, too busy and lost in their work to give attention to any passerby. Maybe a few second glances for Shun, but that was normal. Folk like this held true to their way of life, the simple and hard work of field and animal. Oddities that passed through were not something they would expose themselves to for long, or their preservation of this life might be corrupted in some way. That isn't to say the villagers all ignored them, but they did pay as much attention as they did to some of the loose chicken on the roads pecking at the ground. Shun stopped with Ben just outside the inn and observed with the young lordling the sign that hung outstretched above the door. There, painted on the ornate carved slab of wood, was a bright depiction of a long circle of grass and flowers guarded by walls of trees. A rabbit lay nestled to a deer, sleeping in the bright sun. It was one of the more interpretive signs Sean had seen and couldn't rightly guess the name of the inn. Resting Animal Inn? The Tired Fawn? Sleeping Circle? There were some freshly painted markings at the bottom of the sign that the painted lords were fond of looking at, but Sean was nowhere near blessed or rich enough to learn their scrawlings. The Quiet Glade Inn, Ben said. What an enchanting name. Maybe I was too quick on my guesses at what this place would be like. Maybe something a little more tame. A few road-tired travelers, honorable as they were noble. Maybe on guard to the Rose Road as some small village militia. A musician stretched by the hearth, practicing their trade with a new instrument. A handsome old innkeep with a strong background. Had he been a soldier in the expansion of the roads? Or does he have a tired but muscled back from working fields, finally able to muster the money to open up his own inn, a dream of his since he could remember? Perhaps a daughter working as a barmaid with eyes as bright as baking wheat. Shun believed this delusion less than the last as Ben opened the door wide, lighting the common room with his radiant smile. It was empty, quiet, and empty. Shun didn't expect anything less. The foreign man wasn't sure what tales Ben had overheard from the manor guard he used to live at, but this was not a place for that, especially not halfway through the week during the late afternoon. Huh, Ben said with a dejected tone. Viter, come, he said as he turned to look at the horse and handed the reins over to Shun. 
Sean grabbed at them and then <laughs> looked perplexed that he had. While I am in here, you're in charge of protecting our new friend. Understand? The black and white gelding whinnied a response that satisfied Ben. The young lordling turned and entered the inn with his head held high. When the door swung closed, Shun dropped the reins he had accepted and turned to look down the north road ahead of him. Viter whinnied something to Shun. The foreign man had looked to the horse and then thinned his lips before uttering a quick and genuine apology. Sorry, horse. Shun turned to run. Run away from this man. A dangerous man that handed friendship and protection out like it was his gift to give the world. Ben was lonely if he desired Shun as a friend. But Shun could not be that friend. Shun would not be that friend. Shun did not want to bury any more friends. The sepulcher in his mind yawned and stretched the land to accept more bodies, but Shun would not give it the satisfaction. Although, no, no, all those are buts. The fact that Shun would even have a slight bit of hesitation was the reason why he had to run away and run away now. Shun's feet kicked up dirt as he stomped them down and sprinted northward, away from the positivity Ben promised, the turn toward good he promised. Shun wanted none of it. He could not have any of it. Maybe one day, a day long since past, he could have happily accepted the friendship, but Shun was not that man anymore. He was a living graveyard. No one deserved the burden of his company. No one deserved the end he would give them. No one but death herself. Shun sighed. If only she would have him. I appreciate you listening to me read chapter three to you guys. I hope it enthralled you, painted vivid pictures. I do greatly enjoy reading it to you, honestly and genuinely. But I would be remiss if I did not bring up my other lovely sponsors for today, the wonderful people over at Patreon. That's patreon.com backslash Rory's Brainworks, just like this YouTube channel. They are my story vanguard, my colonizers of dreams. And without them, these storytelling endeavors would be way harder to accomplish. Thank you for spending your time with me. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to this madness, and comment down below what you thought of chapter three. As always, I'm Rory. This is my brain. I'm fairly certain it works. Be safe and go create some art.